Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us on another uh, episode of Topic UFO. Uh, tonight, we're going to be speaking with the voice, the radio host of Open Minds Radio. Uh, besides that, uh, he has just been around for quite some time in the uh, UFO community. He's worked for MUFON. Uh, you see his name uh, all over the UFO websites. Um, I, I just think he's going to have a ton of things to say. Uh, I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of it tonight, but we'll sure get to, to some of it. Uh, of course, I am talking about Alejandro Rojas. Mr. Rojas, are you out there, sir? I am here. Thank you very much for the great intro. And the radio show name has actually changed to UFO Think Tank now. Oh, it has? Oh, I'm so yeah. sorry. No problem. When did that change? Well, that's what it originally was, but while I was working for Open Minds for a couple of years, uh, I changed the name to Open Minds Radio, but now I'm independent again uh, in the last about nine months, and so I, I changed the name back to UFO Think Tank. Well, I, I sev uh, severely, severely apologize for that. Oh, I, no I problem. No know. problem. Uh, so... Uh, you, you've been in the UFO community and, and involved in, in the UFO phenomenon now for, for how long? Over a decade? Over a decade and, uh, like, heavily, yeah. So about 11 years, I mean, have I been really out there investigating and holding lectures or conferences and, and investing a lot of my life to it. Uh, prior to that, you know, I was kind of, I was interested and kept up, but uh, I really didn't get involved until, yeah, about 11 years ago. Wow. And so, I, and I have to ask you, what was it that uh, made you become interested in the uh, UFO topic? Yeah, I guess for a lot of people, uh, it's a sighting that kind of sparks the fire. But for me, it was the Disclosure Project uh testimony given at the press club, Washington Press Club in 2001. And at the time, I was a journalism student. I was a news hound. Um, and uh, when I saw this incredible event happen and it didn't get the press that I thought it should, I really just got extremely compelled to get the word out. And the more I investigated what these people had to say and their experiences, and then also the rest of the highly, highly credible information out there, the more motivated I was to get these stories out there. Because unfortunately, they weren't. Until then, I was under the assumption, which when I had asked people around, you know, why isn't this story bigger? A lot of journalists had told me, you know, well, it's a big story. If I found, you know, the smoking gun or great, great information on it, I'd be out there covering it. And uh, they didn't know of the good information, and I didn't find that to be the case when um, Dr. Stephen Greer kind of laid this golden egg for everybody and gave them this incredible information. They didn't run with it like, uh, you know, many had told me they would. Yeah, you know, uh, I find that very bizarre myself. Uh, this uh, last press conference uh, that I saw up in Washington uh, with all the uh, ex uh, slash retired military folks um, and their testimonies on the UFOs uh, shutting down the missile silos and and things, uh, that you know it came and went and you hardly heard anything. And I mean, how much more compelling evidence do you need? <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunately. I don't know if I would necessarily say it's a crying wolf type of situation, but. Ever since Dr. Greer went to the National Press Club and did his uh, conference, we've had a lot of these uh, in the UFO arena, people kind of trying to to get involved and do the same thing and, and kind of beating a dead horse, I think, in a way. Now, and so unfortunately, I think the one that you're talking about, organized by Robert Solis and Robert Hastings, Correct. didn't get the attention it should have, because like you said, it, they had a lot of amazing people there. Um, but the attention's kind of gone away from, oh, it's another UFO conference at the, the press club. They have at least one a year. So you're right, and there was just an abundance of incredible information. In fact, you know, when I was working for Open Minds, we needed a picture for the magazine, 
And uh, we did go to one website that did cover it uh, in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, and it was a news website that covered it. But, you know, unfortunately, there weren't even a lot of whole UFO guys there to record it and take great pictures. Yeah, you know, maybe, uh, you know, even... I kind of even, regret myself not being there. <laughs> yeah, I would have loved to have been there if I could have. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell us, you've been, you've been in the... Uh, the UFO community now for almost 11 years. What's the biggest change you've seen over those 11 years, if anything? I think I have seen a change. I think I've seen a lot of cycles that continue. In other words, there's a recycling of people, which kind of can be a good thing. Uh, There's new faces. People get really interested in the field for a period of time, and then they kind of, uh, their interest wanes, but then they come back. But there's always new faces, people interested in the topic. And in a way that that's good is that the media doesn't cover the great stuff like the stuff that uh, Hastings had Solace had presented about the nuclear silos. And that allows us the opportunity to reintroduce these stories. So old stories are still good because the major media hasn't picked up on them. And so it hasn't been, you know, a part of, uh, my, you know, common mythos or people don't know about it. So that continues uh, on, but as far as changes, I personally feel there has been a change and an evolution in the media. Uh, certainly in the 90s, there was definitely an uh, overpowering tongue-in-cheek. Every single documentary had to, by mainstream media had to end with the debunkers. Yep. And then you started seeing the History Channel taking it serious. And you know, I remember watching one of their shows on the history uh, of UFOs, starting with Kenneth Arnold and a lot of World War II stuff. And I'm like, you know, waiting for the debunker, waiting for the debunker, and the debunker never came. And they left this question open that there's, an, uh, there's a genuine phenomena here. And the History Channel especially, they had the UFO files. They, ca- they continued to do that. And that, I think, kind of made it okay. You still had some groups like National Geographic, they were kind of the last ones who have uh, kind of grudgingly um, covered the UFO thing but had the debunkers. But now even them, they have a new TV show coming out called Chasing UFOs. Um, I got to uh, be a little bit of a part of it, and I'm in a couple episodes. But finally, National Geographic is doing a show where they're taking it serious. So I've definitely seen an evolution of uh, mainstream media having more documentaries that take it serious, but you also have better coverage. I think when the Stephenville uh, thing happened, for instance, you had Al Roker and uh, who's the other guy that's a co-host with him on the show. I can't think of Matt Lauer. Matt Lauer. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, and Rice asked them well, before they, while they're setting up the, this story, do you guys believe in UFOs? And Al Roker says, yeah. And she laughs, and he says, why are you laughing? And she says, because you said you believe in UFOs, and you don't. And he said, yes, I do. And, and Matt Lawrence says, yeah, I do too. And she said, do you, well, do you guys think they're flying around checking us out? And Matt Lauer says, well, if we could get to another planet, that's what we would do, so why not? Maybe they are flying around up there checking us out. Yep. And she just kind of looked shocked and then introduced the story. But you have more of that where, especially like last year, I wrote a story on uh, – Huffington Post, where I've been blogging about the paranormal, about all of the celebrities. We have had an abundance of celebrities, especially in the last year, really talking about their UFO sightings and beliefs in UFOs, and uh, much more than we've had in the past. And I think this is important because it's, you know, the celebrities, the news celebrities, they're kind of the cool kids, you know, uh, for adults. And if they feel like it's okay to talk about it, I think then uh, your professionals and more adults who are conservative about what they say uh, can feel more open about that. So I think that's important. I do think we have an opening here where this subject is starting to be taken more seriously and people are feeling more comfortable about talking about it. You know, I couldn't agree with you more. And, uh, you know, it seems like even people that had uh, that have had experiences, say, 
15, 20 years ago and never really spoke about them um, are now coming out and speaking about them. They, they finally feel comfortable enough to do that. So Right, yeah. A lot of these celebrities were the same way. I mean, um, for uh, Battle L.A., the main actor, I can't remember his name, was uh, on um, Jay Leno, and Jay Leno asked him about UFOs. He said he had a sighting. And then Christy Brinkley, you know, she's on, been on TV forever. And she came out just all charged it up, and she's like, I had a UFO sighting too. And she tells about a UFO sighting that she had uh, in Cyprus. So she felt charged up. And these were sightings that happened, you know, 70s, 80s. But they're finally feeling comfortable about talking about it. Yeah. Oh, boy, wouldn't that be a, uh, a career crusher back then for some star to, to be talking about that? They'd be put on the exactly. loony list, you know, immediately. Um, and that's exactly. no longer true. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say what I think helped spark even Matt Lauer coming out about the UFO thing is that uh, just uh, maybe even a week prior, he had uh, interviewed Shirley MacLaine, uh, who's someone who's been really brave. Right. I it's mean, she's never had any qualms about talking about her paranormal beliefs and, and her metaphysical ideas and stuff like that. And when she came on the show, he was just gushing and he was so enamored by her and so, you know, uh, and uh, taken by her. And I think that kind of opened him to being more free about talking about um, this sort of stuff. That's kind of how I feel. But um, it's great that she, like you said, you know, back then, you know, they would have kind of looked upon them people as goofy and she's always kind of had that kind of idea now in her older years i think she's getting a lot more respect and i think it's wonderful wonderful that she's been so brave as to be outspoken about her beliefs oh yeah i mean uh you know people uh hollywood has made jokes about her for years and years yeah. and years you know and uh it, it's too bad and but like you say it's it's nice that she is uh got the guts to to stick up for it now uh alejandro um we should mention that you're not just into the to the ufo topic but you're also into the paranormal as well is that correct that is correct and, and my huffington post blog i kind of uh i mostly write about ufos that's what i'm mostly known for and mostly i guess uh, write about uh i have my website ufodailynews.com and you know, even with Open Minds, I was focused on UFOs. So that's what people mostly know me for. But I, I do, I have done other, like, you know, ghost hunts and other paranormal investigations. And I do write about uh, these other topics as well um, on Huffington Post. And I have uh, previously, too, on other websites and things. So um, if you were to... Uh look at all the the ufo activity since say 1946 1947 what do you think is the most impacting uh, ufo case in modern history is it um, roswell is it phoenix lights what? i think you know it's funny you bring up those two because i think those two would probably those would be the biggest i mean roswell no doubt has really captured the imagination of the world and has made uh, the idea of not just UFOs, but of extraterrestrials and this notion of the, these, uh, you know, the typical gray type of creature uh, has kind of swept the world in this whole thing, the whole idea of the coming from Zeta Reticuli. And, and I think that's been big, uh, especially not only back by the stuff that people can make fun of, of these, these little gray creatures with big eyes and stuff like that. But I think it also, the mythos persists because there's so much credible uh, evidence behind the scenes on that one. It's really hard to just um, chalk that to uh, a mistaken identity. So, uh, but also, yeah, the Phoenix Lights, I think, really was a big deal also because, it, I mean, it's one of the biggest mass UFO sightings ever. So I think those two, especially in, in the United States, have been uh, huge influences. You know, uh, the Phoenix Lights, uh, 
the documentary uh, of Phoenix Lights was was what got me interested in UFOs. I have mm. not seen one personally. Um, I'm still very much a believer, uh, but it was that documentary that got me uh, charged up on this on the subject. Uh, now, you can talk to us a little bit about uh, what uh, what the Phoenix Lights. Uh, What's going on with the Phoenix Lights today? Some what, fifteen years later, uh, mm -hmm. is the uh, is the story still uh, there in town? Because uh, from what I understand, you're you're kind of in the thick of it, huh? Right, I am out here in Phoenix, um, and yes, uh, it is still a big story out here, and it's been shocking to me since I've moved out here. Uh, you know, when people ask what I do, I did move out here when I was writing to write for the Open Minds magazine. And when people ask what I do and I told them, you know, they were almost always, they would tell me either they or someone they knew had seen the Phoenix Lights, usually a family member and a family member that they took serious, that they didn't think, you know, this person was joking, that they genuinely saw something incredible. Some of my coworkers, uh, the guy... Uh, who's a good friend of mine, Jason McClellan, who was also the co-host of Open Minds Radio. He um, he did the news for it. He had the sighting, and it's funny. He was a teenager at the time. He videoed the Phoenix Light, but then he later on, he didn't think much of it because, you know, he's kind of a teenager, and he thinks he recorded over oh, that video, which is terrible. really unfortunate. <laughs> and uh, he's embarrassed every time I tell the story. But um, it's amazing how many people, when I first, like you, I mean, I followed the story. I was amazed by the story of Frances Barwood, who is a city councilwoman who took this serious. She found out days later, the media said, hey, what about those UFOs? And she's like, what are you talking about? And they tell her, well, there's tons of people who saw some UFOs over Phoenix uh, the other night. And she said, oh, I didn't know. I'll ask. So she goes into her meeting and says, hey, you know, shouldn't we look into this sighting? The media was just asking me about it. Everybody looks at her funny and moves on. Uh, that frustrated her. And yeah. so she took calls from the public. She said she talked to over 700 people. And I thought, wow, you know, 700, maybe 1,000 people. That's a lot of people. But being out here, I realized there were a lot like more than that. There was 10, maybe 1,000 times more people than that that had seen this thing, maybe even more. So uh, it was a big deal out here, and there are still people talking about it. It's still um, it's a part of the, the story of Phoenix. I don't think you can tell the story of Phoenix, which is one of the you know top 20 cities in the country, uh, top 10 even in size, uh, without including the Phoenix Lights. Uh, I was interviewed by the uh, media out here, the CBS uh, affiliate, uh, for the Congress, UFO Congress um, out here, and they they mentioned it, you know. Um, so even the news, when they talk about UFOs out here, mentioned the Phoenix Lights because it was such a big deal. And then Link Katai, who did the best Phoenix Lights documentary, probably the one you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. Yeah, she uh, still keeps that story alive, too. She does a... Uh, a meeting every year on the anniversary and shows her documentary. She updates it with a little bit of something special each year for people to see. And then uh, the news usually covers uh, her showing the movie. So she helps keep that alive also. You know, uh, Governor uh, Symington. Uh, oh, was, right. The, who was the governor uh, of, of Arizona at the time of the Phoenix Lights, of course, eventually came out and said that, you know, at first he had said, no, I, I don't know anything about it. Then he finally came out and said that, yes, he did see it. Um, you know, it's just amazing that we can have somebody at that level of government who can come out uh, publicly and say, you know, they saw this V-shaped craft, this huge V-shaped craft, and still... Nothing, you know, nothing from the other side to right. to talk to us. I mean, what's it going to take? Now, obviously, you're very much into this disclosure uh, process. 
where are we at? Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Where we're at with this disclosure process? Are we are we making any uh, headway at all? Or yeah, I wouldn't say. I guess I don't know that I view myself as part of a, a the disclosure because I guess there's different levels of it and different perspectives of of how and and what disclosure can be. At one level, by Symington coming out and talking. Is disclosure and real quick, uh, the story of how this happened is really interesting too. James Fox came out because he was doing his uh, documentary Out of the Blue, another great one of the best documentaries uh, on the subject, and he interviews some of the Phoenix Light witnesses, and a lot of them say we were really frustrated with Fife Symington um, making fun of it, and at his press conference he brought out a guy dressed like an alien and told everybody to chill out. So he said, well, do you let me record you? What would you say to him? I'm going to interview him later. Let me record it, and I'll play it for him. So she does, and she's very frustrated and, and, and expressed that. He went to his interview with Symington, and he was a little nervous about doing it, but he said, would you like to hear what someone has to say about that? He says, sure. He plays it. He said Symington got emotional and said, you know what? I really apologize. I feel really bad about that, and I feel really bad that people uh, felt like, you know, they were being made fun of and to feel bad because that, he says, wasn't his intent. His intent was to try to diffuse the emotion because people were really stressed out and excited out here when that happened. And then he went on to say, you know, I saw it. And James Fox is like, oh, my gosh, what are you talking about? And he said, yeah, I saw it. You know, I saw the thing. It was huge. It was Chevron shaped. I used to be a pilot for the Air Force, and I would say, that thing was not human technology. That was from somewhere else. Um, yeah, can you imagine so, being a governor of a, of a state uh, in this era and, and having seen something like that? I mean, that right. was a very hard thing for him to have to handle. I mean, what do you do? I mean, he could have... Exactly. His career could have just gone down the drain if he would have said anything. I mean, his life would have been over as a politician, so... Exactly, there's that. And I'm sure, you know, he doesn't share behind the scenes, but we can, I think, at least uh, estimate a bit that there was some pressure for him to just kind of let it go and move on. Oh, absolutely, um, I'm sure. And not make a big deal out of it. So, because that seems to happen a lot, which he did. So when it comes to disclosure, I think the problem with there, we kind of think of the government as this one entity, but it's not. There's the military, there's each branch, there's CIA, there's DEA, there's uh, the whole alphabet soup. And these guys are very independent. Um, you know, they kind of have their own espionage going on. They have their own intelligence organizations. They don't share information with each other, um, let alone with uh, politicians. So I think it's, it's too difficult because it's, it's difficult to find who has the information. Where has it gone? I think when some groups are, are requested to provide information, it's true that they just don't have information or the information is lost or that it's just there's so much bureaucracy and shuffling that a lot of stuff does get lost. So. It's hard to say, you know, pound on the door. I think pounding on the White House door is certainly a waste of time. Mm. Um, I think if we look at Bill Clinton and his years where there was, I think, a genuine effort to get some sort of information. We have evidence of this where he told his buddy William or Webster Hubble to look into UFOs and stuff. That there, there just was, they couldn't find any, uh, they weren't given any cooperation. We see other politicians, Barry Goldwater, um, all of this uh, type of stuff where they're, they're just not given information. So the White House is certainly the, not the door to knock on. I think what we have to do is buckle down because when it comes to science, it's not an easy thing. When you have a new theory, whatever it is, uh, it's very difficult to get that put forth, to go battle for funds, and then try to get taken seriously even if you have hard science, uh, even if you look at cancer research, for instance, there has to be profit behind it. Um, there's a lot of research going on, even in the field of cancer, that doesn't happen because there aren't funds. 
uh, for that, and there's not kind of a motivation, especially the biggest motivation is is profit. So even when it comes to science, it's a hard thing. Um, so we just have to, I think, uh, treat it like a science if we feel it is a science, and we have to just begin discussions. We have to gather, kind of circle the wagons in that, okay, who are the mainstream uh, out there? Who are the mainstream journalists? Who are the mainstream scientists? that are willing to um, kind of champion this thing and get these people together, get them talking. And just that, just creating a community alone is really what starts to happen to get the wheels moving because then you have these professors speaking, they speak to their chairs or, you know, um, people in their universities become aware. And then that's when they start to talk about ideas. Okay, well, how can this be an advantage to us? Can we get some funding for the school to have a project to look into this scientific endeavor? And uh, would it be fruitful to do so? And, you know, we have to be friendly to these conversations. A lot of times um, the community and researchers can be combative with uh, everyone, Mm -hmm. you know, just completely everyone. With scientists, oh, you're not paying attention. You must be part of the conspiracy. With universities, oh, you're not paying attention to us. You must be part of the conspiracy. Media, you're not paying attention to us. You must be con- part of the conspiracy. And then with each other, you're not paying attention to my work, so you're, you must be part of the conspiracy. So um, instead of this combativeness, I think it's really incumbent upon us to work together as, as much as possible to be open. You know, scientists don't agree at all. Um, I think SETI is a good example. They had a very controversial subject. They championed it. They've got funds and they've gotten rolling. But I've seen, for instance, Paul Davies and Seth Shostak. Paul Davies, a a preeminent astrobiologist who has worked with SETI. And these guys are both part of SETI, but they don't agree on all of the details of this and that. And, you know, I've seen them debate, but they can debate that I feel things are this way. I feel things should move this way but we're still part of the same group and we're still going to work together on this overall project. You know, that's being professional. Um, it's, it's allowing each other to have differences of opinions, allowing each other to debate with each other and then allowing to walk away with, okay, we don't agree on these things, but we agree on these other things and we can move forward together on these other items. I, I agree with you. Um, uh, but let, let me throw a, a hypothetical at you. Uh, over the last few weeks, there has been a what I would refer to as a fairly large UFO flap um, out uh, near Blue Springs, Missouri, out towards uh, Kansas City, uh, Lee Summit area. Uh, uh, stuff has been going on for several weeks now. The local CBS affiliate uh, has been out uh, to the neighborhoods uh, twice doing reports. There's obviously something going on out there. Uh, the people have have seen F-16s uh, or some type of military jets uh, sc- scrambling uh, for uh, a moving orb. Uh, yet nobody from the government has stepped up to say anything. Uh, you know, Alejandro, the, I, obviously there's something happening out there. Very, very strange things. For the government to to not be willing to speak to its people about it, I mean, what what's your thought on that? Well, and I think we have to define government here because the, the jets yeah. are the military. Right. The military doesn't tell anybody anything, and when they do, you can't trust what they say. I think we certainly, and I think that's been a change, a big change, and one of the reasons people take this subject a little more seriously, because certainly in the last uh, five, six years, I think there's been a realization by the general public that this is the case, especially when we get back to all of the controversy uh, with uh, the Halliburton and the Iraqi war, with these trillions of dollars that the, that the uh, defense budget has lost 
and then uh, allegedly they go back and do an audit and account for every single one of these dollars. Yeah, right. I don't think anybody has bought that. And so you get a real cynicism for the military. But unfortunately, what has not happened is anybody figuring out how to crack that egg, how to make them accountable, or to how to have them speak um, to be transparent or to uh, um, to brief the public on, on what the hell's going on. So we could try, certainly try to keep going after the military, but that's what we've been doing for 50 years and have gotten absolutely nowhere. Um, I think that there are a lot of technologies that go on uh, in the defense budgets. Well, there's certainly um, in, uh, you know, in defense that, oh, in cooperation with private companies, the whole military industrial complex idea that we don't know about. But that doesn't stop civilian science to make headway. They uh, don't know about these these projects in the in the defense. They don't um, sometimes maybe even believe there is anything there. But that doesn't stop them from moving forward with their own projects. And I think one of the things is we I don't think it's helpful to feel like a victim in that. Okay, so we know the military isn't going to tell us anything. How we shouldn't stop ourselves because of that. I think we should continue to push and push and move forward. Um, my favorite saying is patience and persistence. That's kind of like uh, the saying I use in my life. And um, that's why it's like, you're right, you know, and we can, and certainly there's some people who will do that. I just don't choose personally to spend my energy um, going after making the military tell me something. But what I do spend my time on is making people aware of this Missouri flap going on and that, uh, Hopefully, you know, it's making the public aware that something is going on here. And then hopefully then you can start to get people to move. McCain tried to get information in the Phoenix Lights. He didn't get anywhere. Um, Congressman Schiff, uh, even um, uh, the governor, last governor of New Mexico. Uh, I can't remember his name right now. He tried to do something about Roswell. Not even these governors have get, or, or congressmen can get information so we, maybe we can exp- inspire them to ask, but I think we have to continue to build these capable civilian organizations and muster resources to be able to truly investigate these things. There's nobody out there right now that can sufficiently organi- uh, investigate this Missouri flap. I'm friends with uh, Debbie Ziegelmeyer, who's the... Uh, the MUFON director out there. I've had her on the show when the flap started in actually November. Right. I had Margie Kay on the assistant director uh, recently. And uh, I'm, I'm a state section director for MUFON. So I love MUFON. MUFON uh, is very, I think is a great organization. However, uh, we just don't have the resources. We're a bunch of volunteers working on our time off right. and right. working with our own limited budget. We don't have the resources, so we really, that's what we need to pursue as an organization that has. And examples would be some organizations such as, you know, some of these groups in other countries like um, uh, CEPA, uh, who is a Chilean organization. It's kind of a branch of the Air Force, so, or actually a branch of their FAA. Um, there's uh, then um, JEPON, which is a in France, which is a branch of their NASA, and I don't know if we could get that level of involvement, but even if we get one university, uh, two universities to champion something and then to start to try to muster resources, I mean, uh, I think we could get a lot further that way. Well, you know, you had mentioned SETI, and, uh, of course, that is privately funded, correct? That whole it is now. project. Yep, it is now completely privately funded. Okay, and I, you know, I'm sure we're talking millions and millions of dollars uh, right. to fund this thing. It, it, something just doesn't seem right if we are pouring money into listening for something that we can't see. Why aren't we at least putting some money into the stuff that we can see? <laughs> right. 
And the reason is, is because they've had a group of scientists. And at first, it wasn't just uh, privately funded, or at least at some, during some period of time, they did have some um, public funding. But, or I mean, government funding, but they had a group of scientists who went forward and sought the org- sought the cooperation with some universities, uh, with scientific organizations. So they're doing just, that's kind of the model I'm thinking of. They did just what we need to do. Um, in the past, it's been done. Uh, really, in the beginning, you had these wonderful organizations, um, such as uh, the one Alan Hynek started, KUFOS, and even MUFON had some more scientists involved at the beginning, but it's kind of waned in that uh, it still remained a civilian, low-funded, uh, uh, volunteer type of thing. Uh, so, and that's kind of been our doom, in, is that we haven't gone the SETI route to be able to encourage people to invest these large amount of money, well, which you know- I think is possible. Yeah, I mean, you can go to college and get a degree as a scientist in, you know, these different uh, scientific fields, but I don't think they have a degree in in ufology yet. You know, that's what we need. We need to get a a college that that teaches ufology, and then they would take it as a, you know. Right. uh, Yeah, it's it's frustrating. I I must admit, it's very frustrating. like you said earlier, that uh, you know people come in uh, as newbies, such as myself, uh, into the UFO community all gun ho, and uh, you know I just think a lot of people get burned out because it's you know it's like hitting your head against the wall <laughs> over and over and over again, uh, mm-hmm. especially when you when you feel like there's there's so much. Evidence, I guess, is the best way to to put it. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, uh, maybe like they say, you know, all good th- or all things in due time or or whatever. So, right. if we as as Mufon uh, members can just simply continue to carry the message uh, and help to uh, extrapolate uh, evidence and that type of thing, maybe that's you know, all we can do at this point, and that's what we should be doing. Mm-hmm. I think uh, MUFON really gets kind of a bad shake at times. I'm not saying it's just because for several years I was the spokesperson for MUFON and their, did their uh, director of public education and uh, PR for them. But uh, I continue to be a big backer because they're a large organization, and even though they haven't been able to um, kind of go this route that I'm speaking of, like SETI, they have been able to create this gigantic network across the country and maintain that network and to continue to gather data. And that data is, uh, is important now for a lot of people doing research and will continue to be really important. And uh, not only that, it's created them this gigantic network across the country where the, there's a media has a go-to place. The media went to Margie K. Um, you know, uh, recently in the, the news reports you were talking about in Missouri. So um, I think that's a valuable, the extremely valuable service that MUFON's had a lot to do with keeping this phenomenon alive and, and keeping the word out there that there is credible um, information to this. I think I've just gotten past the stage of being frustrated to where it's just like, you know, um, there's still, I think, room for us to maneuver and um, that's why I'm doing this conference, the Cosmic Exploration Conference, to bring together mainstream science and the people in this field. Because there is this assumption that scientists aren't interested in this field. That's not true at all. Scientists are interested, and there are scientists uh, involved. And we just have to continue to network these groups of people to make something happen. Yeah, you know, I've often heard that, you know, if you're a scientist, there's two things that you're not allowed to talk about, and that's uh, religion and, and UFOs, right? Um, let's, let's uh, we're getting down on time here, and I uh, wanted to definitely bring up the uh, Cosmic Exploration Conference that you're involved in, coming up uh, October 5th through the 7th of uh, this year at the Tropicana 
Hotel in Las Vegas? That's right. And from what I'm reading about this, it's going to be a little different than your common variety UFO symposium conference. A uh, li little different take on things? Is, is that what it is? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Exactly. You know, it's funny, and, you know, people may be skeptical, but I didn't intend for kind of things to build the way they have. But, you know, as we talked about through here, what my interests are <clears throat> with media, mainstream media and um, science, <clears throat> that's kind of what this conference is all about. And uh, even with SETI, you know, bringing in a speaker on SETI on commercial space flight, it's to talk about the buzz going on with space mysteries right now. Um, U.S. News and World Report actually just have a, had a space mystery issue, special issue out. And they included pretty much science UFOs and uh, the search for extraterrestrial life, which is the subtitle of my conference. So they, they had stories on UFOs, including uh, covering things that Leslie Kane had to say who wrote the book UFOs, generals, uh, pilots, and officials go on the record. She's going to be speaking at the conference. But I'm also having other mainstream journalists, such as George Knapp, who also hosts Coast to Coast occasionally, and um, Lee Spiegel, who's writing for the Huffington Post, which is you know, the biggest mainstream online paper, uh, one of the biggest right now, and they let him you know, cover this subject. I think that's a big deal. It is. That, uh, a paper does that. So, and then as well as having some scientists, we have um, Jeffrey Bennett, who's an astronomer and a teacher and a writer. He's a PhD in astrophysics. And, you know, he's a skeptic when it comes to UFOs, but he's open-minded, he, but he's really into what's hot right now, which is a search for ET, astrobiology and stuff like that. So to talk about that and then to network together you know, other scientists such as Juan Westrom, you talked about how there's not a degree in ufology, which there isn't, but there are different disciplines that all have something to do with this subject. And sociology is certainly a big one, but he's looking towards the sociology. Why do people, um, or why are they so opposed to new ideas? and these these different things that happen out there and that's the kind of take he has um and then also ted peters who is a professor of theology and uh he is really into science and writes for a science and theological um paper he's done a really cool re research in that he was frustrated by like the city guys saying that people are going to freak uh religions are, are in big trouble if uh we discover extraterrestrial civilizations. And so he did a study to find that out. And he found that that wasn't really the case. So he's going to be talking about that, but he's also going to be talking about the tension between um, why people who look into astrobiology kind of um, don't take uh, the UFO research too seriously and vice versa. So he's going to talk about some of the aggression people have back and forth there. And then we have a couple of military people, our ex-military people, um, we have John Alexander. I think he, uh, he, you know, believes that he did his best to find out if there was some big conspiracy behind the scenes in the military. Not a lot of people, or some people don't agree with him, but he says he didn't find that. He says he believes UFOs are real. There have been UFO um, incidents in the military that are legitimate, but that there isn't a real organized um, kind of thing going on because it's too much of a hot potato. Nobody wants to deal with it. Um, kind of controversial, but an interesting aspect. I think at least he has a lot to say as to a good way to approach the subject. And I think at least right now, it's really exciting to have Wilfred de Brouwer there, who was a major general, uh, retired for the Air Force in Belgium, when a huge wave of triangular aircraft was seen out there in the 90s. Oh, yeah. And some of the real credible cases he's going to be speaking about. Um, also, recently, one of the, the photographs, which with the result of that um, flap has been under question. Right. Uh, allegedly, the guy who took it is saying that he had hoaxed it. So it's going to be great to have DeBrower come and talk about, you know, what's the real deal? Is this the guy who took the picture? Was it a hoax? Because they had done some research into it and thought it was legitimate. So he and but regardless, his, his main point is regardless of if the picture is real or not, 
There are military, police. There's so many credible sightings that happened, multiple sightings, mass sightings of these craft over Belgium in the 90s that it's still a real compelling case. So that's who I have so far. Um, but I've got a few more really exciting people that I'm waiting to hear back from. One of them being, like I said, you know, I was involved with that National Geographic television show, um, Chasing UFOs, that starts at the end of the month. Their scientific kind of skeptic, uh, Ben McGee, is going to talk about commercial spacecraft because he is uh, part of a company that um, does consulting for commercial space. Uh, effort. And uh, he's also then going to talk about the television show and uh, some of the what he thought, you know, might be some compelling evidence. Wow. It sounds like it's going to be a, uh, a great get together there. Um, you know, what I think is amazing is, is that combining of the UFO community and the scientific community. I, I don't think I've seen that much. Now, I, I haven't been around that long in the UFO uh, community, but uh, it definitely is, is a new take on things, isn't it? Yeah, it's really healthy, I think, to discuss with serious-minded skeptics because they can give you an insight into where the gaps are, what uh, they, information they may need still. But you know what? Serious-minded skeptics are not afraid of championing and looking into a phenomena, even if they're skeptical of it. And that's what's important to know when it comes to true scientists who are just really driven by inquisitiveness and uh, the will to, or to look for answers. Yeah, you know, I, I, I agree. We need skeptics. Uh, you, you always need that, that other viewpoint. Um, I think the thing that, that upsets me is when they bring on these skeptics that don't have any background knowledge uh proof they're nothing they just sit there and say you're crazy and they call themselves a skeptic you know right I, that that uh, is what upsets me well listen i hear you um we're, we're getting down here on time and so i i want to um let you tell the folks where they can uh find you on the web um first of all the ufo th think tank radio show uh, where can they go on the web to to access that the best kind of place to get all of this is at ufodailynews.com at the top of that site there'll be a link to the radio show and to the conference and then you'll be able to see my stories there uh, i repost my ufo stories from the huffington post here but also write uh, regular stories and then there's a link to my huffington post articles through here also so ufodailynews.com is the best place to go okay all right well we'll get that link up um well listen i've got one more question for you we're down here to just about the last minute there's a picture on your facebook page with you and dan Aykroyd. yes where did that happen and can you give that us that in 30 seconds <laughs> Okay, that happened out here. He was promoting uh, his Crystal Skull uh, vodka that he has out here. Oh, yes. And he has a great interest in UFOs. I so see. we went there and asked if he'd like to do an interview on that. He was really excited to talk about UFOs. So I got in there. He was really friendly and it demonstrated once again how up-to-date he is on this topic. Yeah, he is. I mean, I've watched uh, at least one video of his he is really into the topic. Um, that's right. great. I remember seeing that, now that you mention it, on, on one of the TV shows uh, where, where you were actually talking to him. Um, wasn't it? Uh, didn't I see that on? I don't some... know. It's been pretty much all over YouTube. I don't know about <laughs> a television show. Um, I think, I've see, I, think I did. Maybe. Who oh, knows? you know where I think it was probably on Dan Aykroyd's videotape, maybe, uh, or DVD that I may have seen it on. Huh. I don't know. But that must have been great to be able to, to speak with him. Oh, so, it was a major uh, highlight for me. You could put that on the love me wall. You know, that's where you hang all exactly. that. Exactly. All that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, listen, Alejandro, uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to uh, speak with us. Uh, just amazing stuff. Uh, got the UFO think tank. Uh, we've got uh, the Huffington Post blogs, 
And of course, coming up in um, in October, the Cosmic Exploration Conference, which I just think sounds amazing. So I am hoping to go myself. Uh, not to mention that I do like to gamble from from uh, time to time. Oh yeah, this hotel's been redone. It's beautiful, but. Uh, there is limited space, especially at the dinner, so people want to register early before you lose out, and because it's going to be great to mingle with everybody, and it's very, uh, it's priced very well compared to most conferences out there. Excellent, excellent. Well, listen uh, again, Alejandro. Thank you very much uh, for speaking with us, and uh, we'll we'll keep keep uh, moving the message forward, and and uh, you know. Hopefully we'll keep on keeping on keeping on keeping on. You got it. <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that, that was just a great uh, conversation. Was it not? Um, been around for almost 11 years now in this uh, UFO community and just uh, a lot of good knowledge and, uh, I like his theories as well. I think he has some really good theories on things, especially this, uh, you know, looking at the government uh, and disclosure and all that. Anyway, we're running out of time here, folks. So thanks again for watching. We'll see you on the next uh, edition of Topic UFO. Good night. Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us on another uh, episode of Topic UFO. Uh, tonight, we're going to be speaking with the voice, the radio host of Open Minds Radio. Uh, besides that, uh, he has just been around for quite some time in the uh, UFO community. He's worked for MUFON. Uh, you see his name uh, all over the UFO websites. Um, I, I just think he's going to have a ton of things to say. Uh, I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of it tonight, but we'll sure get to, to some of it. Uh, of course, I am talking about Alejandro Rojas. Mr. Rojas, are you out there, sir? I am here. Thank you very much for the great intro. And the radio show name has actually changed to UFO Think Tank now. Oh, it has? Oh, I'm so yeah. sorry. No problem. When did that change? Well, that's what it originally was, but while I was working for Open Minds for a couple of years, uh, I changed the name to Open Minds Radio, but now I'm independent again uh, in the last about nine months, and so I, I changed the name back to UFO Think Tank. Well, I, I uh, severely, severely apologize for that. Oh, I, no I problem, no know. problem. Uh so information uh, and i didn't find that to be the case when um dr stephen greer kind of laid this golden egg for everybody and gave them this incredible information they didn't run with it like uh you know many had told me they would yeah you know uh i find that very bizarre myself uh this uh last press conference um uh, that i saw up in washington uh, with all the uh, ex uh, slash retired military folks um, and their testimonies on the UFOs uh, shutting down the missile silos and and things, uh, that you know it came and went and you hardly heard anything. And I mean, how much more compelling evidence do you need? 
<laughs> yeah, it's unfortunately, I don't know if I would necessarily say it's a crying wolf type of situation, but ever since Dr. Greer went to the National Press Club and did his uh, conference, we've had a lot of these uh, in the UFO arena, people kind of trying to to get involved and do the same thing and, and kind of beating a dead horse, I think, in a way. Now, and so unfortunately, I think the one that you're talking about, organized by Robert Solis and Robert Hastings, Correct. didn't get the attention it should have. Because like you said, it, they had a lot of amazing people there. Um, but the attention's kind of gone away from, oh, it's another UFO conference at the, the press club. They have at least one a year. So you're right. And there was just an abundance of incredible information. In fact, you know, when I was working for Open Minds, we needed a picture for the magazine. And uh, we did go to one website that did cover it uh, in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, and it was a news website that covered it. You, you've been in the UFO community and, and involved in, in the UFO phenomenon now for, for how long? Over a decade? Over a decade and, uh, like, heavily, yeah. So about 11 years, I mean, have I been really out there investigating and holding lectures or conferences and, and investing a lot of my life to it. Uh, prior to that, you know, I was kind of, I was interested and kept up, but uh, I really didn't get involved until, yeah, about 11 years ago. Wow. And so, and I have to ask you, what was it that uh, made you become interested in the uh, UFO topic? Yeah, I guess, for a lot of people, uh, it's a sighting that kind of sparks the fire. But for me, it was the Disclosure Project uh, testimony given at the press club, Washington Press Club, in 2001. And at the time, I was a journalism student. I was a news hound. Um, and uh, when I saw this incredible event happen, and it didn't get the press that I thought it should. I really just got extremely compelled to get the word out. And the more I investigated what these people had to say and their experiences, and then also the rest of the highly, highly credible information out there, the more motivated I was to get these stories out there. Because unfortunately, they weren't. Until then, I was under the assumption, which when I had asked people around, you know, why isn't this story bigger? A lot of journalists had told me, you know, well, you, it's a big story. If I found, you know, the smoking gun or great, great information on it, I'd be out there covering it. And uh, they didn't know of the good info. I remember watching one of their shows on the history of, of UFOs, starting with Kenneth Arnold and a lot of World War II stuff. And I'm like, you know, waiting for the debunker, waiting for the debunker, and the debunker never came. And they left this question open that there's, an, uh, there's a genuine phenomena here. And the History Channel especially, they had the UFO files. They, co they continued to do that. And that, I think, kind of made it okay. You still had some groups like National Geographic. They were kind of the last ones who have uh, kind of grudgingly um, covered the UFO thing but had the debunkers. But now even them, they have a new TV show coming out called Chasing UFOs. Um, I got to uh, be a little bit of a part of it, and I'm in a couple episodes. But finally, National Geographic is doing a show where they're taking it serious. So I've definitely seen an evolution of uh, mainstream media having more documentaries that take it serious. But you also have better coverage, I think. When the Stephenville uh, thing happened, for instance, you had Al Roker. And uh, who's the other guy that's a co-host with him on the show? I can't think of Matt Lauer. Matt Lauer, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and Anne Rice asked them well, before they, while they're setting up the, this story, do you guys believe in UFOs? And Al Roker says, yeah. And she laughs. And he says, why are you laughing? And she says, because you said you believe in UFOs and you don't. And he said, yes, I do. And, and Matt Lauer says, yeah, I do too. And she said, do you, well, do you guys think they're flying around checking us out? And Matt Lauer says, well, if we could get to another planet, that's what we would do. So why not? Maybe they are flying around up there checking us out. Yep. And she just kind of looks shocked and then introduced the story. But you have more of that where, especially like last year, I wrote a story on. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, there, there weren't even a lot of whole UFO guys there to record it and take great pictures. 
Yeah, you yeah, know, maybe, uh, you know, even... I kind of even... regret myself not being there. <laughs> yeah, I would have loved to have been there if I could have. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell us, you've been, you've been in the, uh, the uh, UFO community now for almost 11 years. What's the biggest change you've seen over those 11 years, if anything? I think I have seen a change. I think I've seen a lot of cycles that continue. In other words, there's a recycling of people, which kind of can be a good thing. Uh, There's new faces. People get really interested in the field for a period of time, and then they kind of, uh, their interest wanes, but then they come back. But there's always new faces, people interested in the topic. And in a way that that's good is that the media doesn't cover the great stuff like the stuff that uh, Hastings had Solace had presented about the nuclear silos. And that allows us the opportunity to reintroduce these stories. So old stories are still good because the major media hasn't picked up on them. And so it hasn't been, you know, a part of, uh, you know, common mythos or people don't know about it. So that continues uh, on. But as far as changes, I personally feel there has been a change and an evolution in the media. Uh, certainly in the 90s, there was definitely an uh, overpowering tongue-in-cheek. Every single documentary had to, by mainstream media had to end with the debunkers. Yep. And then you started seeing the History Channel taking it serious. And 